that wasn't a warning of some sort. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. I am so delighted uh, to be here. And uh, I do want to thank Katina, who I believe is in I uh, Iceland right now. Uh, and oh, there, thanks. And also um, Linda for uh, initially inviting me to come this morning and to share some thoughts. Um, I'm really honored to be invited to reflect and worship with you this morning. Um, I'm not sure how often you've had someone come who had to try to explain the title of their sermon or reflection, uh, but uh, that probably wouldn't surprise some of my students who say, what in God's name is he going to talk about? But I want to try to unpack the title a little bit. Here's just a warning. This is the abstract part of the, of the presentation. I do want to uh, talk and share with you uh, some touchstones in my own life and my own faith journey. And not so much that you get to know me better. I have had, in many ways, quite an unremarkable life. Uh, but uh, that you think in your own lives of those touchstones, those moments, those experiences where you have felt the presence of something more or something else or something bigger uh, that's going on. So uh, the title of this uh, reflection is uh, Gathering Fragments of Hope, colon, Meaning, Purpose, and God. I want to talk about the post colon part of it first. It sounds like an operation of some sort, <laughs> uh, but it isn't. It isn't. Um, I'm a big meaning guy. Um, I I think one of the distinctive things as human beings, and we can talk about other uh, species and so forth, but that we need to have meaning. That we can live days, weeks, months, sometimes very unhappy, years, sometimes unhappy or unsatisfied. But we can't thrive for very long without meaning. Some of you may be familiar with a, a book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, where he was in a concentration camp. And he reflected on how were people able to survive, those who were not killed, how were they able to survive in absolutely inhumane situations? And he concluded that they found some sort of meaning, something. Sometimes it was to shave. Sometimes it was to think of some memory or some hope. But we, you and I are meaning-seeking animals. And by the way, we could pause here just for a second and think about, is that a curse or a blessing? You know, I think some would say it's a curse because yes, we're meaning-seeking and we realize that life is not meaningful at all and meaning is meaningless. Or it's a blessing because we're driven to find meaning. And so um, I think when we think about meaning, it's critically important to know that and I think, again, I hope in your, in your discussions you could talk about this, but I just don't think we can survive without meaning. Uh, that can be situational depression, clinical depression. I mean, th certainly there's biological and chemical and, and neurological factors involved in some of this, but we need to have meaning. And with meaning comes some kind of purpose. Um, the God question gets linked to the meaning question, at least traditionally, that is, Meaning, ultimately, by, tries to find some, we try to find source in something outside of ourselves or something beyond us. Notice the prepositions I'm using here, beyond, above, somewhere. Uh, and so uh, the God question, is there a God, is there ultimate meaning, sometimes is seen as being the flip side of the, of the, of the coin of, is there ultimate meaning? Um, that linkage is interesting because where do we find our meaning then? Uh, as I was a philosophy major in college, and I was really stuck for a long time, and still am, on is there a God or not? I mean, this is just a question. I have a good friend who's a philosophy professor. He said, some of us just get bitten by that question. And it just, and so if, to this very day, I just, to me, it's a dead heat. It's, uh, there it is, you know, full of finish. And, uh, one, you know, so anyway, well, what do you do? Um, and one of the questions that, that has been phrased, and I'm going to uh, talk about this just in a second and, and read a quote, is it's not, so more, it's not so important, is there a God, as much as who is our God? What do we worship? What do we have loyalty to? What do we think life is worth living for? And that's, that's really changed my question a bit. So I'm still, just so you know, the philosophical Part of me is alive and well, and I, I want to know, is there a God or gods or whatever? Is it a force? Is it personal? But on the other side of this, a more helpful question for me, and by the way, I find this in students, 
is, okay, what, what do I worship? What do I make a sacrifice for? What gives my, who are my gods? And so um, David Foster Wallace, uh, uh, some of you may know him, American novelist and short story writer, uh, he gave a commencement speech. And at the commencement speech, he made the following observation. And I think it's spot on, so I'm going to subject you to this one. He said, look, he said, this I submit is the freedom of a real education, of learning how to be well adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide what to worship. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there actually is no such thing as atheism. He takes a drink of water. <laughs> there is no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. Remember, this is a commencement speech. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah or Yahweh or Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths, or some other set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel like you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when it's time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It has been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping the truth in front of our daily consciousness. And so for me, this really kind of changed the question from, well, is there a God to what do I worship? Or what gods do I worship? Um, and in so many ways, then, uh, that, the, the question becomes pressing by, well, where do, we, where do I find meaning? Um, so that's the meaning and purpose part. I'm going to go pre-colon now. That's also a medical term, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and that is a gathering. Uh, I like the word gathering because one of the questions about meaning is, do we invent meaning or do we discover meaning? Right? Invent it is, there's not any kind of ultimate meaning at all. We invent it. We create it. It's totally our creation. So, you know, so in, in a sense, we create reality. Or is there something, something, and we gather fragments? And so that's the second part of the pre-colon title. By the way, when I'm done explaining the title, I'll be done. No, I will not. <laughs> uh, Students have said, Dr. Ebert, you give the longest introductions to courses. Can I be done with the introduction? The course is over. Um, but I like gathering because it's not passive. We have, to, it, we have to do something in this. For a long time, and I'll talk about some uh, instances in my own life, I thought the plan was to discover the plan, to discover the plan of God, to discover the plan of Carl, to discover the plan. And then once I got the plan figured out, I could fit myself into the plan and enjoy the ride. I don't think that's true anymore, uh, for me at least, uh, personally. But rather, I think we find fragments along the way. But notice, fragments, is not, fragments are not the whole picture. It's fragmentary. It's partial. And I think that has really helped me to stop looking for the big picture, but rather to focus on events, experiences that, at least in my life, have been touchstones. So I'm going to share some of those. That's the theoretical part, so you guys can all finally he's done with that introduction and <laughs> move on. Um, and as I do this, I really hope that you think in your own lives, what are those moments, those events, uh, you know, as we celebrate numerous things. Today's Father's Day. We honor and commemorate parenting and, and uh, first day of summer, a few days off, and June t Juneteenth tomorrow. Uh, I mean, a lot of things are converging here. Where, what anniversaries, what events, what persons? Um, have been touchstones for you. So one of the first touchstones for me, this is going to seem weird, but here it comes. 
Uh, I remember being in second grade. And I remember Sister Mary Mary, who was a very good teacher. And she, I mean, she's had a profound impact on me. And I remember her teaching us, and by the way, this was pre-Vatican II, so early 1960s, teaching us that only Catholics were saved. If you weren't Catholic, sorry, uh, you're not going to heaven. And I remember hearing that. I remember vividly hearing it and saying to myself, because I wouldn't say it to Sister Mary Mary, um, that can't be true. And I thought, why can't it be true? And I, it couldn't be true because half my relation was Lutheran. And they were my fun cousins. <laughs> and and if, if I had to be in heaven with my duddy Catholic cousins, I didn't want to go there. And so it was one of those moments where, it, now I could not have had the vocabulary, but there was a decoupling for me, I now realize it looking back, a decoupling of God and religion. Because all of a sudden I wasn't taking hook, line, and sinker on everything that I was told. It was, I was testing, I guess, I mean, again, I was not doing this. This was intuitively. Uh, the second experience, uh, again, takes water for dramatic effect. The second experience was within the same year when my sister uh, was getting married, and she was getting married in the Lutheran church long history in our family about Lutheran Catholic and all, all that. So, um, you know, mixed marriage. Some of you may be familiar with that kind of language. Uh, but the day of her wedding, and I was in third, third grade, the day of her wedding, we were not sure we were going to her wedding because it was a mortal sin for Catholics to go to what I And this I remember so vividly, sitting uh, at the table, and my dad, who was very soft-spoken, uh, was Lutheran, converted to Catholicism, which was part of the friction and the whole thing. And we didn't know what we were going to do. This is within an hour of the wedding. And finally my dad, I was expecting my mom to say something, my, because my mom was more outspoken. My dad said, we're going. And I remember thinking, this is not right, that religion separates us like this. And, and that was an experience that I didn't realize at the time. I didn't have the vocabulary, I didn't have the words, I didn't have the, I don't know if sophistication, I don't know if there's a lot of sophistication, but I didn't have the language or words to articulate what was going on, but I just knew it wasn't right. It was not right. So um, that was for me, I think, really powerful in separating out religion and God question. That, ooh, when we talk about religion, that's human beings responding responding to and trying to articulate their beliefs. I also became more aware, I was in the seminary, by the way, our, da our daughters think, I always say cemetery, but I was in the seminary, which is where you go <laughs> for, they say, well, Dad, you were dead for a while? And I said, well, sure, well, if you want to believe that, go for it. Uh, that uh, that uh, I was in seminary, I was inter really interested in being a priest. Uh, so I was in the seminary, high school seminary, and I remember uh, it was a junior year in college, and again, this will date me, but Midnight Cowboy was out. And I remember going to one class, and Father uh, X, I'll call him, uh, Father X said, you go to that movie, and it's a mortal sin. You do not go to the movie. In the next class, Father L said, I, I have just seen the best movie that I've ever seen. You must go to Midnight Cowboy. I realized, whoa, so there's plural, sophisticated word, plural, diversity within the tradition. There's diversity within various traditions. And I think in all those ways, uh, it, was, it was really important to me to understand that, that religion is important because, by the way, my own Catholic tradition gave me experiences of something more, of something sacred, of something, as all religions try to do in their rituals and beliefs and practices. But there was this sense that hold that God's a lot bigger than any of this stuff. If there is a God, it's got to be bigger than this. And, and I, again, that's carried through in my whole life and probably why I ended up in theology, because things did not make sense to me. Uh, they still don't make perfect sense, hence the title of this talk, <laughs> Fragments. <laughs> right. So the uh, two other experiences, I don't want to bore you too much with my, with my life here, but um, the other experience was 
of uh, I, vocation, I don't know if that language, not vacation, uh, but vocation, a calling. And, and in Catholic circles, when I was growing up, vocation pretty well meant to religious life. And we were taught uh, that, boy, if you have a religious vocation, you don't follow your religious vocation, you will be unhappy for the rest of your life. So there's big stakes here. You know, it's not like, are the Packers going to be good or not this year? I know that's important too. But uh, it's, it's, that was pretty heavy duty stuff. And, and I struggled with it. I was in the seminary, all the seminary, in the seminary, all the seminary. I kind of had a yo-yo view uh, of uh, experience of am I, am I called or not? And then finally I think I recognized, well, call is more than, God doesn't have a plan out there, maybe a vision, maybe a dream that we dream with and have to activate with God. And so I got really interested in process theology, which is a view that God is not all powerful. God is struggling with us. And those moments of love and life are moments that God is calling us for. And the process thought has been really important to me as a way of trying to articulate why there's evil and suffering and so forth in the world. But anyway, I was really, I was uh, in major seminary, which meant I was beyond college. And I was at St. John's University in Collegeville. But part of that program was to study in Israel. And we were studying in Israel, and I decided I had to decide if I was going to go back to the seminary, I was going to get ordained as a um, temporary deacon, which was pretty serious stuff. And I was, I think, again, probably situationally depressed because I could not decide. It was 50-50 to me. And I remember the Benedictine priest who was my instructor at the time, we would go running all the time. And one day he's, I was telling him, I just, I got to decide by Easter because that's just liturgically the time you should decide things, right? Easter's a big thing in the Christian church. So I thought, I got to decide by Easter. And he said, Howard, just let go of it. Just let go of it. Why do you have to decide by Easter? I said, well, because I want to decide by Easter. He said, well, just let go of it. And I say this, and again, a sip of water for dramatic effect. This is always a warning. Something I'm going to say is going to be really important. <laughs> I remember in Israel, on the Monday after Easter, going, getting on a bus to Emmaus, somebody may be familiar with that story, um, and looking in the back of the bus and seeing Palestinian women with their children, and knowing in that instant that I would not go on to the priesthood. It's the clarity was this surprising to me. It was this... And it was just, I still remember vividly just stepping on and looking back and seeing the children and their mothers and thinking, I just don't want that to be cut off from a possibility for me. I was not dating anyone. If Patty was here, my wife would constantly say, tell people I didn't drag you out of the seminary. She did not. <laughs> she wasn't even interested in me. I, it was for me just the, that possibility. And the clarity to this day was one of those moments in my life that it was just right. You know, um, in the Ignatian Jesuit tradition, um, when we're trying to figure out God's vision for us, not plan, vision, uh, uh, um, Ignatius talks about consolation without prior cause, that we have this overwhelming sense of peace and tranquility. And that's some kind of revelation. Now, notice something more reaching out to us. I think that's kind of what it was. I think um, John Wesley talked about the warming of the heart. In that moment, and it just was one of those moments to this day, I always go back and say, okay, there was a breakthrough of something. Again, I know it could have been my neurological functioning, and it could have been that I had endorphins released, and it could have been a lot of, though I think all that probably was involved, but something else was going on. Um, finally, uh, probably the other really deep moment of that there's something else going on was uh, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer uh, back in 1980. She was in her mid-60s and at the time I was just going applying. I had taught high school for a while, junior high and so forth. And I, um, I was going to go on to doctoral studies. I was going to end up going to Atlanta at Emory. And she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I decided, we decided, I should say, because Patty and I were obviously involved in that decision, to stay close to home, so I ended up going to Marquette. So it made a big difference, and as life has unfolded, it's kind of interesting how things work in different ways. I'm not sure it's the best way. It's a, a way. Um, but uh, when she died, it was very, very difficult for me. I ended up 
we were taking care of her. We were just involved in hospice at the time in 1984. Hospice wasn't as well known as it was, is now. And I was giving her a morphine shot and all that. I mean, it was, it was very traumatic for me and for our family. And she died, and I just really didn't know if I could really carry on. Talk about just, it was no me. I mean, it was just, just nothing. And I remember the day we were, we lived in Nina, the funeral was in Brilliant, that the, um, we were getting, we were going to get in the car to go down to the funeral home. And there was an impulse in me. Go get the mail. Not, no voice, no lightning, no thunder. Just go get the mail. Went to get the mail, and there was a card in the mail. And the card was sent from eight students at Marquette, who I had in junior high in Green Bay. So notice the thread here. That wrote a card, and they all signed it. They had heard that my mom had died and said, Doctor, I was the doctor, uh, Mr. Ebert, maybe you can call me Howard, I don't know. But uh, Howard, remember what you taught us. And I remember falling on my knees and thanking God for that moment, because that's, it just seemed as though one of those moments where there was a breakthrough of something, saying, I'm with you. Well, I mean, again, how we interpret this, and then we're into religion and religious language, and we can talk more about that. But that was really critically important for me. And the next thing, and I'm almost finished here, uh, the next thing is, well, where do you put this all together? And I think in the sense of mystery, that God is mystery. Now, mystery doesn't mean a problem that we don't have solved yet. Mystery means something that engulfs us, surrounds, we grow more deeply into us, into it. I think those of you, us who've lost someone and grief and so forth know that we experience the mystery of death very differently through time. And we're never the same. Mysteries change us. Problems, we're good Americans. We like problems, we solve them, we move on. So language about someone dies, someone says to you, oh, you'll get over it. That's treating death as a problem. I don't think death is a problem. I think it's a mystery. And so a card I got, actually from the priest who had said we should go to see Midnight Cowboy, uh, was, uh, Howard, uh, you know that my thoughts and prayers are with you as you enter more deeply into the mystery of life and love and death. The best thing anyone could say, you know, versus she's in a better place and this and that. And, uh, and I think that language of mystery has been really important to me. We have glimpses, we have fragments, but I think it's so critically important to cultivate and, sen and curate a sense of mystery in our own lives, that we are mysteries to ourselves and to each other, that we're surrounded by mystery. We live in a society that's very difficult. You know, I always try to think that when I'm at Lambeau Field, 80,000 people, they're not problems. You know, they're standing in the line to get a rot, or they're, they're using my parking spot. They're mysteries. And it's hard to keep that sense of mystery alive. I think your opening prayer and reflections certainly tell me this group gets it. But the language of mystery has been so very important. Yes, we have glimpses. Let's not overstate. I'm afraid formal religion too often over, overstates what we know of the mystery. But mystery has been really, really critically important. I don't have a conclusion because notice the title of my talk. You want to go back to the title? Uh, it's Gathering Fragments. So I don't have a clear thesis statement and a conclusion because it should be fragmentary. So thank you.